Thank you, Band of Brothers, and Merry Christmas, everybody. Yeah, it's uh, really in the air, no? I mean, if you do not feel it's Christmas, we hope you do. You'll be very miserable. It's the time of gift giving, and today our message is about gifts, because it's Christmas. Did you know how the Christmas tradition of giving gifts started? We are told, according to some, uh, you know, historians, that the tradition of giving gifts at Christmas is said to originate from the gifts the wise man gave Jesus. Do you remember that? Uh, you probably already know this time that the wise men did not visit a baby in the manger, right? They visited maybe a toddler. I mean, it took them several months, perhaps even a year, to reach Jesus as soon as they saw the star. So they didn't visit the manger, unlike, you know, many nativity scenes. Uh, they even give them names, which are not found in any <laughs> part of the Bible. But that's where it started. When the three wise men gave gifts to Jesus, we, you know, we rightfully follow the tradition. But many do not realize that even though we celebrate the tradition of gift giving to symbolize the three wise men and the gift they gave, God really beat us to it. He did it way ahead of us. God is the greatest giver of all of us. And he did that as narrated for us in John 3.16. It says here, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God so loved he gave. So what is the gift really? Another gift is Jesus. It's not just what he did, it's he himself. Jesus is the greatest gift of all time, and through him we're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Now for our visitors, and for those who are perhaps online and are logging on the first time to our worship, we are in a series that we call Know Your Family. What does it mean to know your family? It means you get to know the church you're sitting in. I mean, those are valid questions. Uh, I wonder what this church believes. So what did we do? The first time we had a series, we started with our system of governance. We looked at elder-led congregational governance because that's how we do it. And I told you I believe in it, not just because our bylaws actually put it in place, but because our founders and our former pastors and our present leaders see its biblical basis. So we talked about what are elders and deacons for installment number one of our series on Lawyer Family. Number two, we talked about the four essential doctrines that define our church. You're sitting on chairs, right? Those chairs have four legs. What if one of those legs was removed? You'll be sprawled on the floor. The same way our church is based on four pillars of belief that we say these are what defines heresy or not. If a person, you know, persistently says, I do not believe one of these four, they all stand and fall together. They're all equally important. The first one is the inerrancy of the word. The inerrancy of the word. We took that up after we talked about elders and deacons. The second pillar of our faith is the deity of Christ. Christ is God. Christ is the Son of God who came to earth, added human flesh to himself, and then when he died and rose again, he took on a glorified body, and now he's in heaven sitting on the right hand of God, where he is in his glorified state with flesh that's glorified. So when you come to heaven, do not rush, by the way, to get there. You will see Jesus like that. You know what excites me is one day I'll see the scars on his wrists, on his feet. That's the second doctrine. The third doctrine we looked at is the Trinity. The Trinity. And I love the way that Pastor BJ handled it because he handled both doctrines in one message, which for me is really a Herculean task. Wow. But he did. The doctrine of the Trinity is the third doctrine, and today is the final doctrine. And what is that? Salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. And again, providentially, providentially, I emphasize the word, it's Christmas. And it squarely aligns with Christmas. Why? Because salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. Christ, the greatest gift of God to mankind, 
is really what we want to focus on today as our fourth and final doctrine. This is the last installment of our series. Pastor, why is it so crucial for us to know and believe that when it comes to salvation, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? Before I answer the question, let's pray. Lord, we are going to compress so much into just one short moment. This 40, 45 minutes will go by so quickly and we will not even begin to plumb the depths of this wonderful truth. So my heart's prayer today, Father, is that we will just present your word as it is and make it understandable even to the teenagers sitting among us, if there are, or to the new believers sitting among us, if there are. But at the same time, Lord, may it be a wonderful affirmation of the faith of those who have walked with you for many years. Above all, Father, I pray that if there is someone online or on site here who has never, ever yet realized why they must come to Jesus Christ, with no other plea but mercy, with no other claim but I have nothing with which I come to Christ. And I simply receive what he has done for me on the cross. Lord, I pray that you will continue to call people to yourself. You will save people today, I pray. Because even if just one comes to faith today, Lord, we know there is celebration in your kingdom. So we pray that you'll be honored today by everything we take up, Father. And I pray that your word will be clear to anyone at any spiritual level of maturity, but especially to those who have yet to come to faith in Christ. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Why is it important for us to look at salvation by faith alone, in Christ alone, and therefore by grace alone? Why does it matter? Well, historically, historically throughout history, after the New Testament was completed, that is with the completion of Revelation, approximately around 100 AD, people arguably say the greatest revival in Christian history is the Reformation. The Reformation, and I totally agree with that. The Reformation, friends, the spark of that revival was lit by the doctrine we're looking at today. Justification by faith, and by the way, I will be using the word justification and salvation interchangeably. If my seminary professors are here, they might correct me after the service and say, you know that they're not really equal. I know. Justification is just part of salvation. It's bigger. Salvation is bigger, but we're using them interchangeably for simplicity and clarity. But salvation actually begins with God's selection and ends with our glorification. But I'm just focusing on salvation, and we're interchangeably using that with the word justification. But friends, it is not just because of doctrinal legacy that we think that justification by faith or salvation by faith is important. It is important. But it's most important for you and me personally. Personally. Why? Because friends, it's a matter of life and death that we understand this. I'm not exaggerating. It's a matter, in fact, of eternal life and eternal death that we talk about this doctrine. This is literally what you need to know if you've never come to the realization that we're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. You've got to hear this because your life is at stake here. And if you're a believer already, I hope if it's gotten old to you, you know, the grace of God. Because Jesus knows we have a tendency to, to take his grace for granted. That's why he mandated communion. If grace has gotten old to you, I hope it becomes fresh to you again. So if you're a long-time believer, I hope you come home today being a more grateful worshiper than ever. So let's look at the Word of God, and I want to give you one sentence that summarizes the whole sermon today. We are saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, and therefore by grace alone. That's the greatest gift you can ever receive. We are saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, and therefore by grace alone, and that's the greatest gift you can ever 
and I can ever receive. Please open your Bibles with me now to Romans chapter 4. We will look actually at more than that. Uh, I know the scripture reading is long, so I was talking to people in the back and said, you know, I think they have a clue. We're going to have a long sermon today. I'm already giving you advance warning. But Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, if you're using our pew Bibles, I'm on page 1134 and cross over to 1135. Let me read for you the first two verses and go to our first point. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. What then shall we say? was gained by Abraham, your forefather, according to the flesh. When Paul wrote the book of Romans, he wrote it to a mixed group. The Romans were a group of both Gentiles and Jews, so he's probably reminding the Jews in the congregation of the Roman churches that for some of you who are Jews, you know that Abraham is your forefather, your ancestor according to the flesh. You have genetic links all the way to Abraham. Now, why is he saying that? Because of verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What does he say? Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, if Abraham was justified by works, he can boast, but not to God. What is his point He's going to use Abraham, my friends, as the example of salvation by faith alone. The example of salvation by faith alone is Abraham. And Paul used him to teach the doctrine of justification by faith alone apart from works. Now, I know in any doctrinal discussion, we must agree on terms. So I just put here in our outline, it's actually there in your bulletins, A definition lifted from our seminary textbook just for you and I to to have a clear idea what are we talking about today. What is justification? Why do we keep using the word? Why does Paul use the word justified? Well, friends, justification is an instantaneous legal act of God where two things happen. First, God forgives our sins and simultaneously credits, counts, our sins as forgiven, and Jesus' righteousness is credited to us. Did you get that? I mean, the word used here by Grudem in his textbook is counts. It really means that Christ's righteousness is credited to us even as we are forgiven at the same time by God. It's like this. Everybody knows what Gcash is? All right, I'm sure you do. Okay, so if I will look at my friend Henry over here and say, Henry, I like you so much, I'll give you my Christmas gift. I'll send you 100 pesos in Gcash. And after he survived saying, ang barat ni pastor, no? Uh, He will still receive 100 pesos in Gcash, right? Because I credited to him that amount. That's yours, it's a gift. Do you deserve that? No, you don't. You don't deserve 100 pesos, you deserve more, actually. But... You get the point? That's crediting something that wasn't his. That's what happens in number one. It's a dual transaction. Our sins are forgiven because they're actually credited to Christ. Where? On the cross. At the same time, his righteousness, his perfect obedience, his perfect life when he was walking on earth is credited to us like I credited 100 pesos to Henry on Gcash. That's the first thing that happens at justification, which we are interchangeably using with salvation. The other thing is, he declares us righteous in his sight. Imagine God as a judge. He is, by the way. And this judge says, you're now righteous. Are we righteous because we really are? No, we're not. Here's an analogy. Let's say, my friend here, Eliza, I stole a thousand pesos from you. Uh, If it's Eliza, I'd probably steal more. That's too little, no? Just a thousand pesos. He sues me in court. Files a case against me in court, and the judge says, you owe this lady more than a thousand because she also filed moral and exemplary damages. She will release you, and the judge will release you if you pay a total of 5,000 pesos. Not just what you stole, but other damages. So I stand before the judge. And then the judge says, you're supposed to be sentenced today to prison or whatever, but somebody paid your 5,000 pesos. 
gave it to Eliza. So now I declare you free of your sin, free of your guilt. That's what happened to us at salvation. God declares us righteous not because we're worthy, not because we deserve it, but because somebody paid for us. His name is Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sins. That's why justification, friends, just from the definition you see, is all of grace. It's all of grace. And if the only thing you can take home from this message is, wow, God has done this for me, it's worth it. It's all worth it. Your morning has not been wasted. If you come home just looking at the definition and saying, this is what God has done for me, it's worth it. Now let's return to our text, friends. The clearest affirmation of justification by faith alone comes in Romans 4 as Paul turns to God's dealings with Abraham to illustrate that this truth was always God's plan. Justification by faith, salvation by faith alone always was God's plan. Why? Because somebody could come to Paul and say, you know, Paul, you, you're trying to be innovative. You're trying to be unique. You're trying to be famous. You're inventing a doctrine. And Paul is saying, wait, I want to point out to you the ancestor of all Jews and by spiritual birthright, the spiritual ancestor of all Christians. His name is Abraham. And I'm going to use Abraham, Paul is saying, to tell you I'm not inventing anything new. I'm revealing to you what has always been the plan of God. And what is that? That we are not justified by work. Look at verse 2. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. No one can boast before God. When it comes to works, I mean, you can boast before people. You know me? I'm a very righteous person because I'm a pastor. I'm very righteous. Uh, I might fool some of you, but not God. That's what Paul is saying. When you are seemingly living a good life, it's not enough for God. That's what, let's see what it says in verse 2. If Abraham was justified by work, he might boast about something to people, But it will not stand before God. Then in verse 3, look at your Bibles again. He quotes Genesis 15, 6 and affirms there that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. You see his argument? Verse 2, not by works. So, you're saying it's not by works. So, what is it by? It is by faith. That's verse 3. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, or counted to him as righteousness. They're after the same. In Genesis 15, 6, God credited righteousness to Abraham by means of his faith. His works had nothing to do with it. Because look at what he says going to verse 4 and 5. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. What does it mean? If I go to my dear friend Marisa here, say, Marisa, I want to I wanna be your employee. Okay, so I work for her. And then after 15 days, I come to her and say, Sweldo ko. Where's my salary? I work for it. I earned it. She should give it to me. What Paul is trying to say is, if somebody could be credited for his work, it's not a gift anymore. It is rightfully earned. He's saying that because in verse 5, he will say now, and to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, of course, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, his faith is counted as righteousness. Are you following his logic, his argument? Not by works, verse 2. Verse 3, it is by faith, even from the time of Abraham. Verse 4, the reason he's saying it's not by work, you say, because if it's by work, you actually earned it. And he's saying now in verse 5, nobody earns it. Nobody earns it. But you are, when your faith is exercised, he says in verse 5, and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Now, I took a children's Bible. Because it took me some time to understand what verse 5 means. So I'll, I'll cut 
I'll cut to the chase. Verse 5 in the children's Bible goes like this. Listen to this. If people trust in God, even though they cannot earn righteousness, he declares sinners right with himself. That's verse 5. That's a children's translation which I finally understood. He declares sinners right with himself because their faith makes them right with God. Now let me summarize verses 1 to 5. If I do anything that remotely resembles me trying to earn God's favor, what are those things? Baptism, attendance in Green Hills Christian Fellowship, membership in Green Hills Christian Fellowship, ministry in Green Hills Christian Fellowship, or if you want even an even bigger church or a more famous church, or what else? Ministry somewhere elsewhere, sacrifice, offering, etc. If I even think remotely that any of this makes me more worthy in the sight of God, I am trusting in my works. Even if I say, but I have faith. I have faith plus, plus my works. So God, you've got to be reasonable, God. Faith in you plus my good works. And Paul is saying, has been saying from verses 1 to 5, no, no. If you even think that there is the slightest amount you could add to God saving you, you're actually saying, I'm not saved by faith alone and therefore by grace alone. I'm saved by me. That's the argument of Paul. A gift can only be given apart from any work. Any amount of work negates a gift because it means you earned it. Romans 3.24 tells us, and you can turn there if you want, but I'll read it for you. We are justified by His grace as a gift to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, the point of Romans 4, 1 to 5 is we are saved by grace alone. We are saved by grace alone. And the way we're saved by grace alone is through faith alone, in Christ alone. Because if it is faith plus works, it's not a gift anymore. If it is faith plus works, it's not by grace anymore. You know, I love this point. There's probably someone sitting here. I, I, I can glance at all of you, but I cannot see into your hearts. Maybe someone sitting here who's been holding out on really, really coming into a full relationship with Christ. Because you think, I'm too sinful. God will have nothing to do with me. So I'm here because my, my wife drags me here, or my parents drag me here. But if you only knew what I've done, you'll say, God shouldn't save that person. I have news for you, friend. A man or woman, I have news for you. Because salvation is purely by grace. It's enough for your sin. You know, as human beings, if somebody's very good, you know, somebody's very religious, you know, and they think they're saved by faithless works, and then they can't finally come to faith, all of us, we're happy, right? We're cheering. Yes, that woman was like a living saint, and finally, she has put her faith in Christ alone, and has been saved by grace alone. We're happy for you. We're not always like that. And somebody is very sinful, you know. Do, is there any politician you do not like? Some of you of saying, uh, makatanggal ang ulo niyo, no? Uh, so, think of somebody you really do not like. I, I can think of a lot of politicians, but I do not want to sin this morning. <laughs> he, he steals our money. He has a very immoral lifestyle. He gets away with crimes. And then, he gets saved. Genuinely saved. Can you cheer for him? If you be honest, you struggle, right? Bakit siya? <laughs> right? That's grace. That's grace. You get it? Grace will save that man or woman whom you already thought was a Christian before they even got saved genuinely. But it will save that man or woman whom you hate or you cannot cheer for when they get saved because of all people, 
This, this, this murderer, this rapist, this corrupt government official, they got saved. But that's grace. That's why some call grace scandalous. Not for God, for us. It embarrasses us that we think somehow we deserve grace more than the other sinner. That's grace. That's why I'm trying to drive it home, friends. Because salvation is purely by grace alone. And only by faith alone in Christ alone, it's available even to the worst of sinners. So friends, I will now jump to verse 16 because of time. But Paul sums up the principle behind using Abraham. He actually used more than Abraham. He used David and other Old Testament saints and other examples of salvation by faith alone in verse 16. Look at verse 16. It's a good summary. Paul said in verse 16, that's why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace. Did you get that? That's a great summary. Pastor, why is God insisting on faith alone? Because friends, if it's faith plus works, like the most common religions will tell you, then it's verse 16. It has to be by faith. Because the promise of salvation, the promise of glorification, the promise of restoration, the promise of adoption, the promise of being with God forever after this life and Christ walking with you in this life, it's all based on grace. And any addition of works to faith negates grace because it's no longer a gift. So pastor, what is faith then? What is faith? If, if, the, if it all depends on faith and it's guaranteed to all offspring of Abraham, spiritual offspring, what is faith then? What is faith when it says in verse 16 to the one who shares the faith of Abraham? I want to have that faith, Pastor, like Abraham did. Well, what is faith? Uh, look at your Bibles. There are bits and pieces you find about faith. In verse 18, you have an idea what faith is in uh, Romans 4.18, in hope, he, Abraham, believed against hope. What was he talking about? When God told Abraham, you're going to have a baby, Abraham believed God, and God counted it, credited to him as righteousness. This is what he really believed in verse 18. In hope, he believed against hope. Why? Because biologically, it was impossible. Sarah is what you'd call right now a senior. So it was Abraham. Uh, are there young people here? Young people, what if your grandma tells you, I'm pregnant? You're going to fall off your seat, no? I would also fall off my seat. That's Abraham. That's what God is saying here. In hope, he believed against hope. I mean, they did not know everything about medical science, about hormones and endocrine function, but they were wise enough to know, Sarah, you stopped having your cycles a long time ago, years ago. And Abraham, you're an old, doddering old man. In hope, he believed against hope. He defied the facts. He did not think, look at the biological impossibilities. He did not look at scientific, logical Realities, he just believed God. That's why it was credited to him as righteousness. Another clue about faith is verse 20. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. He simply refused to not believe God. And so the summary of faith, friends, I believe this is one of the best definition of faith I find in the Bible. It's like the equivalent of Hebrews 11, 6. Verse 21, Romans 4, 21. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he has promised. That's faith. Faith is to say, God, I take you at your word. You said that Christ died on the cross for me. I believe. You said that I must exercise my will and say I put my confiding trust, helpless, dependent, childlike trust in what Jesus did on the cross. I do. That's faith. That's verse 21, friends. That means I'm fully convinced that once I've done that, you will do what you promised. Jesus is to forgive my sins and give me eternal life. And in this present life, you will walk with me throughout this life. Now, pastor, 
doesn't mean that faith is my good work. No, 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 no. Faith is the means through which salvation is given, but not an act, not a good work that earns favor with God. I know this sounds paradoxical. But in order to understand that faith is not a good work itself, that we're justified solely because of the merit of Christ's work, let's look at Romans 5, 17 to 19. We'll show that on screen. There's so much in this verse that I will just read this for you verbatim. I mean, you could preach an entire sermon on these three verses alone, but I just won't comment on it. Romans 5, 17 to 19. For if because of one man's trespass, who's that one man? Adam. That reigned through one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign and life through one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. So one act of righteousness. What is that? Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross. One man's, uh, one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by, the, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Again, that's Adam. By one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Pastor, why many? Why not all? Because friends, only those who exercise their faith. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. But we do need to exercise our faith. And that's why we will look at the meaning of faith in a while. But I would just like to summarize salvation by faith alone in Romans 3.28. And I think Pastor Meigs gladly told me this morning, Pastor, we put that here to, to, uh, this morning. Last night wasn't here yet. So look at that verse. It's a great summary of salvation by faith alone. Paul said, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. I want to be fair to people who probably are in your life. Some of the sincerest, most religious, most passionate people I know genuinely think that I have faith and good works. Wouldn't God be fair? I believe most Filipinos walking around the streets actually believe that. Friends, Take this verse to them, Romans 3, 28. And if they can explain it away, then maybe you and I are believing the wrong things. But this verse is so plain, it's clear as day. It's Paul saying, inspired by God's Spirit, one, a person is justified by faith apart, apart from the works of the law. It's never, never faith plus work. It's faith alone, in Christ alone, because it's all by grace alone. That's what Paul is saying. That's what we're saying about the example of salvation by faith. Let's go to the effector of salvation by faith alone. Effector, friends, means implementer, the one who makes it happen, the one behind it, the one who has moved it, and that Jesus Christ. That's now found in Romans 4.23. To five, two. And in this passage I gave you, you see at least two elements of saving faith. What does saving faith involve? Number one, believing what God says in his word about Jesus Christ. We call that the gospel. Saving faith, friends, involves knowledge. Saving faith involves intellect. There's something that you and I must accept. And what is that? God's record. Look at verse 23. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone. Verse 24, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. Who is the him? God. What do we believe in God about? His record, his assertions about Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. The gospel. We must exercise our mind. Our knowledge must be informed 
about what Jesus has done. And I don't need to read the whole verse to you, but you probably know the gospel is well summarized in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4, which says that Christ died for our sins, he was buried, he was raised. It talks about the entirety of Christ's life and his purpose for coming. That's the gospel. We must use our minds and believe what God says about Jesus Christ. Number two, saving faith involves acknowledging sins that may need Christ's death on the cross. That involves our emotions or conviction. Look at verse 25. Talking about Jesus who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. In other words, I cannot just say, okay, now I know about Jesus. It's good to know about Jesus. That's not enough. I must also say, I am guilty of sin. This sin has made Jesus die on the cross. He died on that cross so that if I put my trust in him, he will save me and forgive me. So friends, it involves a recognition, a conviction of sin that moves our emotions and says, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. And number three, this is found in the rest of scripture, friends. I must decide to trust Jesus to save me personally. There are many people who stop at the first two. I'm sad to say. Oh, I believe. I believe what the Bible says. Knowledge. Number two, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. And I need a Savior. But have you done number three? Maybe you're here today and this applies to you. Have you done number three? Have you said in your heart, I must decide to trust Jesus to save me personally? This involves will. Trust involves the will. It's a decision we make. That's John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You've got to decide. What happened on the cross? What happened on the cross? Jesus died there. Was he a victim? No, he was a willing sacrifice. Why did he have to die on the cross? Because we all have sinned. We cannot ever earn God's favor. We cannot have a relationship with God. We are under the curse of God. We are under the judgment of God. The wrath of God is suspended over our heads all throughout our lives. And when we die without receiving Christ, the wrath of God will pour upon us in full infinity and permanently, eternally. And so we must turn to Jesus Christ and tell him, Lord Jesus Christ, you're God's only way. I refuse to accept anything and believe in anything except what you did on the cross. You did that for me. I put my faith in you as my Savior, my substitute who took the penalty for my sins. When you do that with a simple childlike faith, God looks at your heart to assess your sincerity. If he sees the sincerity of your prayer, pleading for mercy and putting your faith in Christ, God says, I forgive you. From here on, you are my daughter. From here on, you are my son. From here on, I will never let you go. Scripture actually, friend, puts repentance and faith together as different aspects of one act of coming to Christ for salvation. Acts 20, 21. Paul said his ministry was summarized as testifying of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Paul is an evangelist, a missionary, church planter. What was the summary of his ministry? That's it. Look at your screen. Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Are those two things, pastor? No. They're not two different things. Please look at this diagram. Could we show that, please? Again, it's lifted from our seminar textbook. I hope I'm not reminding you of your professors. It's just a necessity. Look at this. If you are not yet a Christian, you're holding on to your sins, right? But conversion is one act where as you turn your back on sin, because you recognize your sins, may Jesus die on the cross for you, and you repent of it. Repent is simply to turn your back on sin because you change your mind about it. Used to be okay with you, but now you realize it simply merits the wrath of God. You now say, 
I will turn my back on sin because I've changed my mind on it. Metanoia, repentance. And simultaneously, I will listen to the call of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and put my faith in him, turning to him. You see, it's simultaneous. That's conversion. It's not two, two separate things you do. I turn my back on sin because I've changed my mind about it. It has offended the holy God. And I turn to Jesus Christ. That same holy God's only mandated way for my forgiveness, for my reconciliation. I turn to him. It's one act. Simultaneously, repentance toward God and faith in Christ. If you look at this diagram, friends, you begin to understand why a lot of gospel preaching and teaching today has produced such bad results. And we, I'm sad to say, who handle the word of God are mainly at fault. You see, sometimes we're driven by numbers. We've got to produce numbers. So just talk about, don't you like to believe in Christ? You know, if you go out on the street today, if you ask somebody, would you like to believe in Christ? 99% will tell you, of course I want to believe in Christ. But that's not the whole message, friends. The whole message is, we have offended the holy God. His judgment is waiting for us. It can pour on our heads anytime. If we die, in fact, we're already tasting some of that judgment. The misery of life apart from Christ is simply part of the consequences of our sins. And because I have offended the holy God, I will come to that holy God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and plead for mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's repentance. And I now put my faith in you as God's only way. That's faith. And a lot of preaching today just talks about, won't you like to believe in Christ? Preaching the need for faith without repentance is preaching half of the gospel. That's why sometimes you'll encounter someone who say, you know what, I accepted Jesus Christ five times. Why am I still like this? Ask them. Did you recognize that your sins are the reason Christ died on the cross? Did somebody tell you that? Did you believe with all your heart you've offended the holy God and you ask forgiveness for that too? Or you just, did you just pray a prayer? That's the danger of following a prayer that you don't really understand. Did you just pray a prayer? Oh, yes, I did. Did you understand what you're saying? No. So that's why. You must recognize it needs repentance about sin and faith in Christ, and they're inseparable. Because the same Jesus who invites us to receive him in Matthew 20. 1128 is the same Jesus who demands absolute lordship of our lives as well. That's actually the reason why sometimes, some of you have done this, you, you say, Pastor, would you please talk to this friend, this relative? So I do. It, you set me up for that, and I welcome it. Then I find out your friend, your relative, is very, very successful. They're on top of the world. So you talk to them, you, you present a very simple gospel, you just tell them about Christ, and they'll very politely, diplomatically tell you, I, I think that's all good, sir. But I just don't see really, really see the need for it in my life right now. And in my heart of hearts, there are words I cannot tell the person. You know what words I would like, I can tell you, Okay. You don't see the need for Christ because you're on top of the world. Your net assets are okay. Your bank account is full. You're going to build another business yet. Or you're going to be promoted now to executive vice president. Or you're going to get another woman on the side. You're on top of the world. So you have no need for Christ. And that, my friends, is heartbreaking. Because what we see is success in this life. It's often the most common reason why people will not come to Christ. You see the two extremes? One, I'm too sinful. He will not do anything with me, and we, we already told you he will. The other one is, I don't need him. 
I want you to know they're harder to save. I don't need him because I'm successful. I don't need him because I'm already good. The religious people. I think I've shared this before. Some, somebody when I was still in South Metro asked me to witness to his aunt, sat down with her, and she told me, you know, I belong to this order. You know, the, I will not say the name. Uh, we, we do something very special with the mother of God. And uh, I told her, but ma'am, this is what the Bible says. You know, she cut me off. Alam mo, iho, that was the end. <laughs> Called me iho. <laughs> Basically, she was refusing to listen to me because she was very, very religious. This morning, I want to ask you, which one are you? I am too sinful. God will not accept me. Good news is he will. Just come home. Just come home. I don't need Jesus Christ. I'm on top of the world. May God break you. May God remove everything from you that you put your trust in. I promise you it will be worth it. If you lose your wealth, your women, your real estate, your investment, your position, and it saves your soul, it's worth it. Or number three, I'm a good person. I don't need that. Alam mo, iho. Are you like that? Are you like that? What does it profit a man or woman who gains the world? Loses his soul. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Our final point, I'm sorry, I'm really taking a lot of time, is the effect of salvation. By faith alone. This is really, really inspiring for me. We are justified. That's Romans 5, 1 to 2. Look at, I read it for you. Just so inspiring. I want to read this for you. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. Did you see that? Not faith plus work, by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What are some, I emphasize the word just, some of the blessings of being saved by faith? One, peace with God. What is that, Pastor? Assurance. Assurance. Before salvation, we are the sworn enemies of God. Before salvation, we are separated from each other by our sins against Him. And his judgment is rightfully belonging to us. His wrath is rightfully waiting for us. But after salvation, we have peace with God. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And with the peace with God comes the peace of God. John 14.27, peace I give to you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. Peace with God leads the peace of God. Number two, access into grace by which we stand. The word in which we stand could also be translated as by which we stand. And we believe this refers to perseverance. We stand firm in our walk with God, not because of our grip on God, but because of His grip on us. You know, I love this. Because if my walk with God depended on my grip on Him, my faith on Him, I'm going to fall. But no, it is He who has me in His grip. So, when you're a genuine Christian, you can now sing the song that we always sing. When I fear my faith will fail. Oh God, I don't deserve to be a Christian anymore because my faith is wavering up and down like a sine wave. He will hold me fast. When the tempter will prevail, Lord, when I commit embarrassing sins, when I fall flat on my face and the whole church knows or my family knows or my friends know I've fallen flat on my face and I'm a professing Christian, when the tempter will prevail, He will hold me fast. Perseverance. That John 5, 24, truly I say to you, Jesus said, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. 
He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Has passed from death to life. It cannot be undone. And thirdly, Paul says in verse 2, rejoicing in hope. What is that? You need to read all the way to verse 5 to recognize he's talking about endurance. Endurance. What makes people hold on to God instead of walk away? Hope. Hope. I know God will come true. The days are dark. My business is struggling. My spiritual life is up and down. My marriage is on the rock. My children hate me or my parents hate me. But I will not lose hope. I will not take my life. Because I have hope and I can endure. And that's actually found in Romans 5, 3 to 5 that follows verse 2 where Paul says, All of this that God has done for you helps you be steadfast in this life. Maybe I should read that for you. I'm over time anyway. I might as well make the most of it. (laughs) It's really beautiful. Look at this verse 3. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character and character produces hope. So there is hope on salvation and you get even more hope as you suffer because it produces even more hope from endurance. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You never lose hope. You never, ever lose hope. Let's close with Galatians 2.16, which summarizes our entire sermon. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. Please tell this to your well-meaning, sincere, passionate religious friends, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. No one is saved by works. No one is saved even by faith plus works. Friends, we are saved by faith alone and Christ alone and therefore by grace alone. That's the greatest gift you could ever receive. You're going to get a lot of gifts this Christmas. Have you already received the greatest gift? The gift of Jesus Christ. The gift of forgiveness through him. Put your trust in Christ alone. As you turn your back on the sin that has offended our holy God. Put your trust in Christ alone. And you will receive the greatest gift that anyone could ever give you. Please, do not deny yourself this gift. Come to me, Jesus said. All you who labor are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Seize, take hold of this gift. Dear Father, we pray that if there's anyone here who's been a long time believer, they'll come home today saying, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus. My Lord, but Father, in case there's someone here who thinks he or she has just gone too far in sin and you cannot redeem them, Lord, correct their misconception. Remind them of the prodigal son. The only thing the Father wanted from him was to come home. Let that one come home today. Or maybe, Lord, there's someone who's just too successful. And so they're holding out. They're probably here against their will. Maybe they're online. Lord, I just pray that you, if you need to, Lord, remove from them all these things they're counting on, which keep them from coming to the cross. Probably the most painful thing they'll ever experience. But Lord, may they realize it will be worth it when you redeem them. Father, if there's someone here who's just, who just thought that they were enough religiously, 
for you to forgive them. Lord, just correct that misconception in their hearts. They cannot and never will ever be saved by adding their works to faith. Let them instead come helpless, dependent, broken, surrendered to the cross with no other plea but mercy, mercy to a sinner. And let them put their faith in the Savior who died for them. Father, whatever spiritual need there is in anyone listening to us here, meet it, we pray to our Lord Jesus Christ. For we pray in His name. Amen.